Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. So, this is a part three. So, if you haven't heard part one and two, uh, go over there and get caught up, and then come on back here. So, at least this failed fledgling had a great name. Unlike the weak and watery Swoose Goose. I mean, Howard Hughes supposedly hated the Spruce Goose moniker for his Hercules, and I think it was still better than Swoose. But Black Bullet, now that's a great name. That's even a superhero name. So, just like the other birds in this series, the idea for this aircraft was born from the same AAC specification, seeking, you know, better performance, armament, and pilot visibility over the fighters of the day. Jack Northrup had always had a thing for flying wings, so he decided to take on the competition with a flying wing fighter. The result ended up looking a little like a propeller-driven American cousin to the ME-163. The XP-56 Black Bullet was a stubby fighter, which was planned to carry an impressive two 20mm cannon and four 50 caliber machine guns in the fat nose. Behind the armament sat the pilot, and behind him, the X-1800 pusher engine driving two counter-rotating props. There was still that problem of the pilot bailing out and getting sliced and diced in the mixmaster in the back, so Northrop designed the prop shafts with a collar of explosive cord to blow away the prop before bailing out. You'd want to have a cover on that switch to avoid any embarrassing mistakes. I was going to say the tail had a small vertical fin on top and a bigger one at the bottom, but this plane didn't really have a tail. Or maybe it was all tail. These birds sometimes defy the usual way we think about these things. There is definitely no horizontal stabilizer or elevator. These functions were taken on by split surface drag rudders that were installed on the very cool looking drooped outer wing panel. These provided yaw control when the horizontally split halves opened on one wing or the other. For pitch and roll, Northrop employed elevons on the inboard wing sections. When they operated together, they worked as elevators for pitch. When they worked differentially, they acted as ailerons. Another choice was to make the airframe and the skin out of magnesium. This would take the aircraft out of the feeding chain for war-scarce aluminum, and was thought to also be advantageous as magnesium weighs about 30% less than aluminum, and should be stronger and allow for a smoother skin. These were all good features, but welding magnesium was a newish technology, and Northrop developed a special welder the patented Heliarc welding system in order to build the XP-56. So if you've been listening to the series, you know how this goes engine-wise. The X-1800 was cancelled, and instead of going shopping for another exotic inline liquid-cooled power plant, Northrop went for the more conventional Pratt & Whitney R-2800 air-cooled radial. As it was already powering such normal airplanes as the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt and Vought F-4U Corsair, you'd think that this would go easier. But Northrop engineers now needed to fit this air-cooled round peg in a tight space which had been intended for a liquid-cooled square peg. This was a lot of changing and ended up delaying and making the first prototype, AAF serial number 41786, heavier, and pushing it back until March 1943. The first prototype finally flew on September 6, 1943, and there were control problems, especially in yaw control. Work on correcting these problems took a month, and it must have been very frustrating to all involved when on October 8, a blown tire during a high-speed taxi test caused a crash. The airplane was toast, but at least the pilot survived. Luckily, there was a second prototype in the works. The second prototype had a much larger dorsal fin in order to try to correct the yaw control issues 
and it took to the sky on October 23, 1944. The second black bullet was just as unstable and uncontrollable as the first. As well, the maximum speed achieved by this aircraft was disappointing. And so, after only 10 test flights, the XP-56 was grounded for good. But at least it survives to live in the collection of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. In the next episode, we're going to see if lightning strikes twice, or three times. If you like this kind of content, make sure you like and subscribe, please. Thank you. Until next time.